Welcome to this week's seminar on GeoTop A. We're going to have the pleasure of listening to Steve Odo from INRIA, who's going to talk about signed rank decompositions for multi-parameter persistence, from Mobius inversion to relative homological algebra. Looking forward to your talk, Steve. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Catherine, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk. It's a pleasure to be here at this seminar. So the content of this talk is based mostly on three papers that are available in the archive. So you can see the references at the bottom. By the way, can everyone see uh, my mouse pointer? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So oh yeah, so three papers uh, on the archive. The references are down here. So the first paper is referred to as BOO, the second one OS, the third one BOS. So B stands for Magnus Botman. Uh, one of the O is myself. The other one is Stefan Opperman. And the S here is Luis Scarpola. So um, first of all, before, before I actually uh, get down to the details of the, of the, of the talk, so I want to set up some terminology. Um, so throughout the talk, P is going to be a poset, set, um, and K is going to be a fixed field. And what I would call a persistence module will be just a functor from that poset set to the vector spaces in that field. Uh, most of the time, I will be considering finitely presented uh, or finitely presentable modules, unless otherwise stated. Um, in fact, more generally, we can talk about pointwise finite dimensional modules, but for the uh, purpose of the talk, the modules will be finitely presented, unless otherwise stated. Now, an interval in that post set is going to be a convex connected set. And uh, a class of modules that are of particular interest in this talk are the interval modules. So these are the indicator modules of an interval in the post set. Uh, so, the, the, so these modules have an endomorphism ring that is isomorphic to the field, so uh, they are indecomposable. And they're going to serve as, build, as building blocks to whatever constructions we will be making. So among the intervals, there are two types that are of particular, like, partic particularly particular interest. Um, so the close the, the segments. So the segments are defined as the for for a pair of comparable elements S and T. The corresponding segment is the set of elements in the post set that are stand in between S and T. So imagine your post set being the plane equipped with the product order. Then S is comparable less than or equal to T if it stands to the left and bottom of to T. And so the uh, corresponding segment will be a rectangle bounded by S and T. And the other type of uh, intervals that I will be most interested in are the hooks. Uh, the hook has a minimum element, let's call it S, and it's basically uh, defined as the set difference between uh, the upset of that minimum element and the upset of some other element that is bigger than it. Let's call that element T. And uh, as a special case, you could imagine T as being infinite. So if you add an infinite, infinite point to your post set, in that case, all that remains in that hook is basically the whole uh, upset of S. All right, so here we're interested in the rank invariant. Uh, the rank invariant plays a central role in one parameter persistence theory. Um, so here's an example of a one parameter persistence module. It's indexed over the integers from one to five. Uh, it's actually derived from a one-parameter filtration, simple shell filtration, using homogene degree one. And the rank invariant of the module, uh, if you see the module as a functor, it's actually the invariant that encodes the ranks of the internal morphisms of the module. So the images of the arrows and the post set through that functor. And uh, in the one-parameter case, you can actually visualize the, uh, uh, the graph of the rank invariant seen as a function. Of over the pairs of comparable elements. So here, the function is indexed over uh, the upper half plane above the diagonal. And the graph here is given as in a color code manner. So darker red means higher value. And the actual integer values are given here. So as you can see, the graph actually has this nice arrangement structure. It's an arrange it comes from an arrangement of triangles that are sitting on the diagonal. And in fact, the rank invariant is nothing but the counting function associated with this arrangement of triangles. So, excuse me for a second. I'm going to remove this. So, this being said, now there is a nice compact description of the rank invariant. If you consider the apexes of the, these triangles that are sitting above the diagonal, so this representation as a diagram of point we know as the persistence diagram of the rank invariant. 
And the an alternative version is to consider the bases of these, the hypotenuses of these triangles. So we get a barcode sitting along the diagonal, and this is what we usually refer to as the persistence barcode of the ring here. So uh, this representation is nice because then you have a decomposition of the rank invariant as a sum over all the, say, the bars in this barcode of the rank invariants of the interval models supported on these bars. Okay. Otherwise stated, the rank invariant of your model is actually the same as the rank invariant of the direct sum of those intervals. Um, now this is nice for interpretation because now if you want to know, for instance, the rank invariant from index 2 to index 4, all you need to do is to count the number of intervals in your barcode that connect the lower set, at U, the downset at u to the upset at 4, at, uh, at 2, sorry, to the upset at 4. But more fundamentally, this is not just a visualization tool. It actually tells us what is the algebraic structure of the module, because as we all know, in the one-parameter case, the module actually decomposes as a direct sum of interval modules. And these interval modules that appear in the direct sum are exactly the ones that appear in the decomposition of the rank invariant for the simple reason that the rank invariant is additive on direct sum. All right, this decomposition is unique and therefore it has an algebraic, and, and it also has this very nice algebraic interpretation. So that each bar actually corresponds to the lifespan of some like uh, generator in your model. Right now, uh, and finally, of course, it's useful for uh, like in practice, you can compute it very easily in practice, decomposition in practice, because you can apply a Möbius inversion formula. And this, this remark was made, I mean, the formula first appeared in a paper by uh, Herbert Lowsbrenner and co authors, but then it was connected to the notion of Möbius inversion by Amit Patel. Now, we want to do the same thing for multi parameter persistence models, so say a two parameter, for instance. Uh, let, so let's try to consider an example with a three by three grid standing in the, in the plane. Uh, again, the plane is equipped with a product order. Um, and um, so here's an example where it is actually not possible to decompose the rank invariant as a sum, positive sum of rank invariants of interval models. So why is it not possible? Where, well, um, we can see this by looking at these arrows here. These two arrows, we see that there are identity, identity maps in our module. And so what that means is that if you could decompose the rank invariant, basically one of the intervals in the decomposition should include these two points here, and therefore the, the, it should include this whole rectangle that we see here. And likewise here, we also have two identity maps, and therefore there is one interval in our decomposition that should include this whole rectangle as well. So now the question is, are these two intervals the same interval, or are they different intervals? And in both cases, we end up at a contradiction. So let's look at the first case. Suppose they are the same interval. If they are the same interval, then this map here, going from this index to that index, should have rank 1, because the interval would span, at the very least, the union of these two rectangles. But now we see that the composition of these two maps is actually zero, so the rank, the rank of the model is not one between these two indices. So these two intervals cannot be the same interval. They have to be separate intervals. But now, if they are separate intervals, then we see that these two rectangles actually saturate the dimension vector of the representation that we have here. And because of this, there cannot be any other interval in the decomposition. There is no room for them because the whole dimension vector is saturated already. So um, what that means is that then the rank of the map between this index and that index would have to be zero. But now, as you can see, if you compose these two maps, you get a rank one. Okay. So here again, we now fully find a contradiction. So this is a counterexample that shows that you can not always have nice decompositions of the rank invariant as positive sums of rank invariants of interval models. Nonetheless, you have decompositions, but if you admit uh, to have, if you uh, allow for negative uh, weights, okay, in the in the decomposition, in the sum. And here's an example of such a decomposition for this module, and here's another example. So what is the difference between these two uh, examples? Well, this one is not minimal, and this one is minimal in a certain sense. Okay. Now the question is, when do such decompositions exist? For which classes of intervals, and under which conditions and the modules? And whenever such decompositions exist, can we say that they are unique and under what conditions? Are they so this is a question that has been looked at by uh, people by, uh, like Amit Patel and co-authors, maybe Facundo Memoli, uh, Wu Jin Kim, and forgetting a number uh, other, of other people. And for to answer this question, they basically looked at the theory of Möbius uh, 
functions, okay, which was developed notably by Rota. Um, so uh, let me set up the mathematical framework. So again, P is a fixed pose set, K is a field, and now we're going to look at all the rectangles, the collection of all rectangles on that pose set. So this collection of rectangle, uh, rectangles, in fact, segments, as I defined them initially, I'm going to call this uh, collection seg of P. Okay, so these are all the segments in my pose set. And now I'm going to see the rank invariant itself as an integer value map from seg of P. So how is that possible? Well, just because you know the rank invariant is defined over every pair of comparable elements S and T, and to every such pair corresponds bijectively exactly one segment in my uh, pose set, which is the segment that has S as minimum element and T as maximum element. Okay, so I can really see the rank invariant as an integer value map over seg of p. Right now, uh, I'm going to define the rank decomposition of a, any function, not just the rank invariant, but any function, real value function over seg of p, as a pair of multisets of, of segments in p, such that r is obtained as the difference between the rank invariant of the direct sum of the indicator module supported on the elements of the first multiset, minus the rank invariant of the Dirac sum of the indicator module supported on the elements of the second multiset. I'm going to call k sub, sub curly r the, the, the first Dirac sum, and k sub, sorry, uh, cur, curly s the second Dirac sum. And now it's pretty clear that these such decompositions cannot be used, right? because you can always add one more segment here and a copy of itself here, and then the two will, the rank, the rank invariants of the two will just cancel out. So there is no uniqueness possible with this definition. So we're going to add some more, one more ingredient. We're going to say that the decomposition is minimal if this multisets R and S are actually disjoint as multisets. Okay. And then we will have, we will have a notion of minimal decomposition and we will be able to prove that these minimal decompositions are unique and there are some conditions. So now let's get down to how we use the Möbius inversion theory uh, to prove this existence and uniqueness of such minimal decompositions. So we're going to look uh, more generally not just as at segments, but we can look at arbitrary collections curly i of intervals. Oops, sorry, in the pose set. And so we're going to pick one of these collections. You can imagine this collection as being the collection of segments, but that can be more general than this. And now we're going to see that collection itself as a pose set, as a different pose set from P, but it's it's a pose set itself when we can see, we equip this collection with the inclusion order. Okay, because each element in this collection is actually a subset of P, so it's a set, and so we can consider you know the relation given by uh, inclusion. And so that gives us a, a pose set structure uh, on on I. Now, for technical reasons, we're going to use the inverse inclusion instead of the reverse inclusion, instead of the usual inclusion. This is because, well, for reasons that will become obvious later on. And now we're going to look at the incidence algebra associated with that pose set I. Okay? So the incidence algebra, as a reminder, is uh, the algebra formed by those by the z-linear, uh, the, sorry, the, the z-valued functions over the collection of segments in I. Okay, and that collection of functions has a natural, uh, you know, uh, vector space structure uh, or module structure. Sorry, but we can also equip it with a product, which is given by convolution, and the formula for the convolution is given here. So you can you can convolve two such functions to get another function. And now, if you assume i to be locally finite, so what that means is that any segment in i is actually composed of finitely many elements. Then for any I, little i and j in this collection, uh, there are only finitely terms, many terms in this sum. Yeah. Right. So now this incidence algebra has a unit. Uh, the unit is given by the delta function. So the delta function really is the indicator of i being equals to, equal to j. And uh, there are two other notable functions in this algebra. One of them is called integration. Its nickname is zeta. Okay, it corresponds to integration because if you take a function f and you uh, convolve it with zeta, you're actually integrating f just because zeta is 1 everywhere. And now the zeta function has an inverse which corresponds to differentiation, in fact, and this inverse is called mu or the Mobius function. And it also has a nice uh, recursive formula when you want to actually compute, for instance, its matrix. 
Right, now let's consider not the functions in the incidence algebra itself, but we're back to functions valued into the integers on i itself, not on seg i. Okay? Because if you remember, the rank invariant was a function on the set seg of p, which is our set i here, not a function over seg of seg of p. Right, so these functions actually form a right module over the incidence algebra, where the right product is given by convolution by functions in the incidence algebra. And here's the formula for the convolution. So again, uh, you have to be careful because this sum might be infinite, so you need to make some assumptions on the function r. Uh, here we're going to say that it has locally finite support, which really means that the support of r is going to be finite whenever you restrict it to some downset in i. And now, um, now the thing is that when you write I R as a sum of indicator functions of elements in I, you can massage the expression by using the fact that mu and, and zeta are inverse of each other to end up at this expression here. And this expression is interesting because this convolution here is nothing but the indicator of the upper set of I. And so what that means is that R now any real, uh, z valued function on i is on curly i is actually expressed in the basis of the ups, the indicators of the upsets in the poset i. And uh, the coefficients in this uh, decomposition are given by uh, the Möbius inverse, inverse of our function r. So this is the general theory, and now you can specialize it to the case we're interested in. So let's take the case where i, curly i, is actually the collection of segments in our ground rule set P. We're going to assume that it's locally finite, which again means that we're going to assume that every segment in our collection of segments is finite. Sorry, every sorry, every segment that connects two elements in our collection of in our collection of segments is finite. And now, uh, if you look at one particular segment, R, uh, and if you ask yourself, what is the indicator function of the upset of R in curly I? Well, this is, what is this upset? This is, these are exactly those rectangles that are included in R. And this is where the fact that we took the reverse order, inclusion order, and not the, include, the actual inclusion order matters. Like, say R is the uh, rectangle that connects S to T on the right-hand side, then the upset is formed by all these rectangles that are included in the in rectangle ST. And so the support of this function is basically exactly the same as the support of the rank invariant of the, inter of the, of the segment module supported on the segment ST. It's exactly the same thing. Because the rank invariant for the integer, the integral module supported on ST is in fact uh, composed of those rectangles that are included in it. So when you use the previous formula that comes from this slide, you specialize it to it to this case. Then basically you know that every z-valued function over the set over the segments in the poset can be decomposed as a linear z-linear combination of rank invariants of uh, segment modules or integer, inter, uh, integral modules supported on segments. Now, if you, now what you can do is given such a decomposition, basically you dropped the, the segments that have a coefficient that is zero and then you put in the positive part those segments that have a, that have a, you know, a coefficient that is positive and the multiplicity, the corresponding multiplicity will be the actual coefficient. And then you can put every other segment in the negative part of the decomposition. And there you get a minimal rank decomposition this way. And this minimal rank decomposition is what Amit Patel and his co-authors uh, call the generalized persistence diagram of the function R. But you don't have to specialize yourself, the, the thing specifically to the segments. You could take, for instance, the upsets in the ground rule set P. Okay, so the upsets, what's interesting is that each upset of a single point I mean, in the rule set P uh, the poset of these subs of these upsets given by inclusion or reverse inclusion is actually isomorphic to P as a poset. Namely, when S is less than or equal to P, then the upset of S actually contains the upset of T. And now, uh, if you look at the ups the indicator function of a an upset of one of these upsets, 
in the collection of offsets. This is exactly the same as the Hilbert function of the uh, generator of that offset in P. And so now for any z-valued function over the collection of offsets, uh, you have a decomposition, or any equivalently for any z-valued function over P itself, because we have this isomorphism of both sets, then every such function actually decomposes as a z-linear combination of Hilbert functions of indicator modules of some of these offsets. And so this gives us a decomposition of any such function. In particular, if you think of R as being the Hilbert function of a module, then that Hilbert function of any of this module will decompose as a z-linear combination of Hilbert functions of uh, free modules, basically. And so you can build, uh, you know, uh, the equivalent of a minimal decomposition, but for Hilbert functions in the same way. Except that the basis is a different one from previously. Previously, the basis was given by the, you know, the rank invariance of rectangle modules or segment modules. Rather, now the basis is given by the Hilbert functions of uh, the free modules. And now you can generalize this actually further. You can actually generalize this pretty arbitrarily for, to any arbitrary collection of uh, intervals, assuming that this collection is actually locally finite. And then again, you ask yourself, what is the indicator function of an offset in the collection of uh, intervals that I've chosen? Well, uh, there it's not an obvious thing to actually define, uh, understand what this is, but um, um, people like uh, Wilhelm Kim and Memoli and Facundo Memoli actually identify this upset as being the, uh, in fact, the, the support of the so-called generalized rank invariant of the interval i. So if I pick an interval i, as you can see in blue on the right hand side, and I ask myself, what is the upset of that interval i? Well, these are all the intervals that are included in i, and I want to identify a function. I want to work out a function whose support, which will be the indicator of that upset. And this, the function they came up with was the following one. So if you start from a module over uh, the post set, and uh, you restrict the module to i, and then you take the limit and the co-limit of this restriction, and then you take the, the, the unique map, the essentially unique map from the limit to the co-limit, and now you take the rank of this map, then this rank is actually, um, uh, if the module is, uh, sorry, this is called the generalized rank invariant of the module. And now, if the module is taken to be the indicator module supported of that interval, then it's going to be 1 for any interval that's included in it and 0 for any other interval. So as a side note, this notion of generalized rank invariant already exists in the literature on um, uh, representation theory. It's connected to the, uh, the, the concept of global rank function developed by, by Kinzer in the years 2000. Right. So, so far, so good. So we've got a theory that allows us to, as soon as we can use Mobius inversion, we can define, uh, you know, what we, what we, can, uh, we can prove existence and, and, and uniqueness of minimal rank decompositions. But now there's a number of questions that arise immediately from this. So one of them is, okay, so what if I choose my uh, collection of intervals to be not, not locally finite? Okay. So then, you know, convolution by the Mobius function will not be defined anymore. Now uh, you can you will also consider uh, some families, some classes of both sets where uh, basically uh, the Mobius inverse would not even exist, right? Convolution would not be able, would not be well defined in general. Um, and so that's one question. Another question is, um, okay, so we've decomposed. The, uh, the functions that we consider over a certain basis. And the basis was given uh, by these, uh, you know, upsets that we have here, these, ups these indicator functions of upsets. But maybe there are other bases out there that we could use, right? And uh, in particular, this is connected to the third question, which is, um, you know, so far what we've been doing is that we're, we've been taking the rank invariant or generalization of the rank invariant. We've been expressing it in a certain basis, but this is done at the functional level exclusively. This has nothing to do with the, mod the module we're considering. You could take your module, take its rank invariant, and then you can just forget about the module and the whole theory unfolds. Now, can we go back to the structure of the module? Namely, can we have an interpretation of this decomposition that we get in terms of the actual structure of the module, not just of its invariant? Pretty much like in the one primary case where we observed that the decomposition of the rank invariant actually corresponded to a direct sum decomposition of the module itself. Do we have something like this in, in our set? 
And then, of course, um, the, the last question maybe that is important is what about the stability of these decompositions? Can we say that if we perturb a module a little bit, maybe in the intermediate distance, then uh, can we say, to what extent can we say that the decompositions are going to be uh, stable, pretty much like in the one parameter case? And this is connected to the question of, well, so far we've been using minimal decompositions, but might we want to use non-minimal ones? And would that be giving us, giving us anything interesting? And so these are the questions I want to, the, the second part of the talk is actually going to try to address. And this is where uh, I'm going to actually do make some connections with a relative homological algebra. So let me uh, tell you about two results, the two main results that are in the first paper that I was mentioning in the list on the first slide, this BOO paper. So the first one, uh, the first result actually is about not the existence um, of rank decompositions in general, but the existence of minimal rank decompositions as soon as there are some rank decompositions that exist, and the, the uniqueness of those minimal rank decompositions. In fact, the theory that we have been looking at so far actually relies heavily on Möbius inversion to prove all this. But in the general case, when there is no Möbius function, uh, or even no convolution at all that is defined, uh, can we still say something about the minimal decompositions, assuming that we have some decompositions? And the answer is yes, we can say something. As soon as you have the guarantee that there is a decomposition that exists, then the minimal one will exist as well, and it will be unique. And it will be obtained from your decom from whatever decompositions you have by just you know uh, canceling out the common elements in the positive and in the negative parts. So let me give you an example where this is useful. Consider, for instance, one parameter persistence modules that are just PFD. Okay, these, these, these modules, uh, you know, the, the underlying post set is R, and, uh, you know, it's not locally finite in any way, and you can't just, you can't apply uh, the theory of Mobius inversion on that post set directly for these uh, PFD uh, modules. So you would have to consider finitely presented modules because then for a finitely presented module, you know that there are finitely many uh, you know, generators and relations and therefore uh, you could basically take the restriction of your module to a grid, compute the decomposition there because the grid would be finite. Uh, then you could use Mobius inversion, compute a minimal decomposition there and then use CAN extensions to uh, basically get a decomposition of the original module. But if you just have a PFD module, you can't do that. But you can still say that, you know, there's a barcode there. We already know that for PFD models, there is a decomp direct some decomposition of the model. This is a result by Crowley Bovey. And thanks to this, we have one of these decompositions of the rank invariant at our disposal. And now what the result that you see on the slide says is that this decomposition is actually the only one and only minimal one. And, okay, so the, 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 you know, the, the central ingredient or maybe the main ingredient in the proof of this result is that the rank invariant is actually a complete invariant on direct sense of segment modules. Okay. So it's not a complete invariant at all in general, but if you take modules that decompose into direct sums of segment modules in, in a POSEC, then this is going to be actually a, a complete invariant. Now, the second result is probably more interesting, um, probably deeper. Uh, and it says that, you know, going back to the question, the list of questions I had here, and the second one in particular, which was, well, are there other families of intervals which could act as basis for uh, z-value functions rather than the, you know, the uh, functions given the, uh, the upset functions or the, uh, the rank invariance of rectangles? And the, the answer is yes. Actually, when uh, we look at the segments in the post set, if we assume this post set to be an upper semi lattice, then you not only have the rank invariance of segment modules as a basis, but there are other bases out there. And one of them is given by uh, the, rank, the rank invariance of um, hoop modules. And this is interesting because I claim right here that, uh, in fact, the hoop modules are better suited as a basis than the rectangle or than the segment modules. And I'll, we'll see later on why. So the key idea behind the proof is actually to uh, use relative homological algebra and to work in the pretending group associated with the so-called rank exact structure uh, on the category of modules we're, we're interested in. So if you, if you will, what I will do is I will leave aside the proof of the first result. Um, I will rather focus now on the proof of the second result and I will introduce the rank exact structure. 
All right, so now we're working on the, you know, on the category of persistence modules over a coset, and we're going to assume the modules are, well, most of the time they will be finitely, uh, finitely present, presentable. Uh, at this point now, I'm only assuming that they're pointwise finite dimensional, but very soon they will be finitely presentable. All right, so, you know, in, in this category, you have a whole collection of ex short exact sequences. Okay, and if you want to do homology for algebra, you have to consider all these short, you have all these short exact sequences at your disposal. Now, the problem with the ranking variant is that, con in contrast to the Hilbert function, is that the ranking variant is not additive on every uh, short exact sequence. So you don't have, uh, you know, whenever you have a short exact sequence, zero A, B, C, zero, you don't always have rank of B equals rank of A plus rank of C. Okay, ranking variant of B equals ranking variant of A plus ranking variant of C. You have that for the Hilbert function, but you don't have it always for the ranking variant. You have it for the split exact sequence, for instance, because the ranking variant is uh, additive on, on direct sums, but you may not always have this. So uh, the trick is to say, okay, so if we don't have it on every uh, short exact sequence, then why don't, why don't we, well, give up on those exact sequences that don't satisfy this additivity property? So let's now restrict the focus to only those exact sequences, short exact sequences on which the ranking variant is additive. So now you may ask me, why do I care about this? Well, the reason is because we want to use, you know, the picture is the following. So you want to compute, you want to, um, you want to obtain rank decomposition from resolutions. But to obtain rank decompositions from resolutions, you'd better build resolutions over which the ranking variant is additive, because otherwise the resolution will not give you a decomposition of the ranking variant. And to get resolutions over which the ranking variant is going to act additively, uh, then you know you need to uh, first of all sh consider short exact sequences on which the ranking variant is additive. So this is why we're doing this. Now I'm going to call curly E sub rank, so E rank, the, the, the this collection of short exact sequences. And now it follows from standard results. Uh, uh, most notably, I'm citing a paper by Auslander and Solberg from the 1990s that. This E rank actually defines the structure, the structure of an exact category on our module category. And more than this, so it's an, it defines an exact structure, so we can start talking about doing uh, homological algebra, but to actually build resolutions, we need more than this. So what we have is that uh, whenever P is finite or an upper similitis, then this exact structure actually has enough projectives. And, and in fact, you can show that every module that is uh, well, P is finite, so every module that is point-wise finite dimensional, which is the same as finitely present, uh, presentable, has finite projective resolutions. And if P is a summer, a, a per similitis, then you have the same guarantee. So first of all, the exact structure has enough projectives, and every finitely presented module has a finite projective resolution. And finally, the last ingredient that we need is what are the projectives, by the way? Well, we, we, we would like the projectives to be modules of the kind we want, right? Ideally, maybe rectangles, but then it was a surprise to us that the projectives in this exact structure are not rectangle models. They are actually hook models. And this is why my claim that hooks are better than rectangles for what we want to do comes from. The, you know, the relative, the projective relative, the relative projectives, sorry, uh, are the indecomposable ones. The indecomposable ones are the hook models. So every projective is actually a direct sum of hook models. Right, and so basically, when P is finite, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 ranking variance of uh, the hook modules actually generate the whole space of uh, ranking variance of finitely presentable modules over in our uh, module category. And if likewise, if P is an upper semi-dense, so what happens is that when you take a finitely presentable module. Uh, you basically unfold its minimal rank exact resolution, which exists in this context, and then given this resolution with terms M0 through Mn, then what you do is you take the rank invariance of those terms and put minus 1 to the i coefficients. Okay, so you get the rank invariant of M as the alternating sum of the rank invariance of the, of the N. So all this is expressed in the, in the relative rotending group, but you can, since the ranking variant factors through the relative rotending group, uh, you can really replace this by an expression involving the ranking variance. So that's how you prove that the ranking variance of hook modules actually generate uh, the whole uh, space of ranking variance of finitely presentable modules. 
Uh, now, the fact that the, the minimal decompositions are unique comes from a different uh, set of considerations. Well, in the finite case, it's basically a dimension argument. All right, so here's an example of a module that you see at the bottom. So it's a very simple module. It's an interval module supported on this little L shape. Um, and uh, here is its uh, rank exact resolution, minimal rank exact resolution. So in degree zero, you have these three terms, and indeed they are hooks. Sometimes the hooks are degenerate into uh, half open rectangles, but uh, they are hooks nonetheless. And you have also other hooks in the second, uh, in degree one. And the length of the resolution is actually one. Uh, here, the coefficients here that you see in these matrices uh, are the coefficients that you assign to each of the, you know, there's a one canonical morphism between any element here, non zero morph, uh, between any element here and any element over there. Sometimes the morphism is zero, but sometimes it's non zero. Uh, and so the coefficients are the ones given to the non zero morphisms. So from this resolution, as I was saying, because we're working the rank exact structure, we know that the rank invariant of our base module is actually obtained as the difference between the rank invariant of the degree zero terms uh, and the rank invariant of the degree one terms. And in this particular example, you see that there are no duplicates in the degree zero and degree one, so this decomposition is actually minimal. But it may happen that the decomposition obtained from this uh, process is not minimal. For instance, if I add to this original base module, I'm adding this other summon, uh, which is a hook module, then this summon will appear in the resolution only in degree zero, because you only need degree zero to resolve it, it's a projective. And so, and so, yeah, this, the new, uh, you know, the new resolution will be this one. And of course, the, the formula will still hold, but then there are two terms that will actually cancel out in the alternating sum. So now we have two different concepts at our disposal. We have uh, two different concepts of minimal resolution, of minimal decomposition of the ranking here. We have the size minimal one, which we used up until now, which is the one that has the smallest size, for which the positive and negative parts are actually disjoint. And there's the one that comes from minimal, uh, you know, uh, uh, rank exact projective resolutions. And in this one, I don't want to actually cancel out these two terms. I want to keep them. And I'll explain to you why this is useful. So maybe I should stop here and ask if there are any questions in the audience related to the, uh, this part of the talk. Okay, good. Okay, so let's proceed. So now here's the, comes the last part of the talk, which is about stability. So why is it useful to actually keep these terms in our decompositions is because they will be useful for getting stability results. So let me, before I proceed, let me tell you a little, a little story. So suppose you work with uh, plain barcodes from one parameter persistence, okay? And, um, you know, when you want to com compute the bottleneck distance between two barcodes, or you can see, let's treat them as diagrams, as persistence diagrams. So let's say you want to compute the bottleneck distance between two persistence diagrams. Now, what you usually do, because you're allowed to map points on the diagonal, everybody knows this, one thing that you can do is to the first diagram, you can, you can add the projection of the second diagram onto the diagonal. You can enrich the first diagram with the projection of the second diagram onto the diagonal. And likewise for the second diagram. So, and now the, uh, you know, the bottleneck distance can be expressed as the Wasserstein infinity distance between these two enriched uh, sets of points where Wasserstein infinity is really the usual Wasserstein distance for probability measures, because now the two measures have the same, have the same weight. So this is well known to everyone, I guess. Uh, but now if you play the game of adding, then you know you could add one point to one of your diagrams and add uh, you know, a dummy point, which would have negative weight, at the same location and add it to the other diagram. In fact, now what's going to happen is that, of course, naturally you would want to map the two together, but you can also now map that point to other points in, in other diagram in your matrix. And now when you do this process of adding points, you're actually reducing the actual Wasserstein distance. So if you add points both positively and negatively to one of the diagrams, then what happens is that you can only decrease the Wasserstein distance. And you can actually decrease it like far, uh, quite a lot, like quite a lot. And this is exactly the story that I'm going to tell here. So first of all, let me tell you what I mean by trying to prove, by like getting some bottleneck stability results. 
So, and for this, I'm going to take the very simple case of the Hilbert function. So I'm not talking about the ranking theorem. I'm going to talk about the Hilbert function. I'm going to use Hilbert, like decompositions of these Hilbert functions. So again, the decompositions are given by Hilbert functions of free modules. Okay, so one of them would be given by taking the minimal free resolution and then using the alternating sum formula that we saw earlier. Okay. And, you know, so uh, this, this decomposition can be given by, uh, so therefore, the multigraded Bell numbers. And so what should be the notion of bottleneck distance that I use here? So it's a question that has been out there for a while. Like how can we express the stability of multigraded Bell numbers? Actually, those were, 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 were believed to be unstable for the simple reason that we see on this slide. So let's take this example. We have a free module on the left-hand side. It's K supported on uh, 0, 0, plus, where plus means that we're taking the upset of the point 0, 0. And then on the right-hand side, we, we took the free module and we, we, we removed, you know, the bottom left part of it. So we get this third case here with generators and relations. And uh, now the Bedi number of, you know, the free module just has one, one guy in Bedi 0, whereas the other, the other module has a bunch of guys in degree 0 and a bunch of guys in degree 1. Now, what, how do you define the bottleneck distance between these two? Well, what is the matching between these two guys? We don't know. I mean, if we ask to have an exact or perfect matching, then, uh, then we're screwed because, uh, you know, we, we, there is no perfect matching here. So the bottleneck distance expressed in the usual way between these two sets of bidding numbers would be infinite, whereas the interleaving distance between the two models is actually fine. It's one half. Now, um, the, the, the way around this follows the idea that I was mentioning about the one parameter case. So instead of comparing, you know, putting all the bidding numbers from one module on the one, on the one side and all the bidding numbers from the other module on the other side, what you want to do is you, make, you want to mix up the, the bidding numbers. So the bidding numbers in even degree from the first module will be on the left, and the ones of odd degree from the second module will be on the left as well. And, and symmetrically, the bidding numbers of even degree of the second module will be on the right, and the bidding numbers of on the degree from the first module will be on the right as well. So what that means is that on the picture, you take the relations here and you put you, you associate them with the first module instead of associating them with the second module. And if you had relations in the first module, you would associate them with the second module. And now you're looking at matchings with, between the two. And now suddenly you can get many more matchings and you actually get a matching a bottleneck distance that is actually equal to the interleaving distance in this case. And here is the optimal one possible choice of optimal matching. So you match the generator here with one of the like the one in the middle, the generator in the middle here, and then the relation each relation here is associated with one of the other generators of the second one. And this is what how we define a sine version of the bottleneck distance. So basically, the sine version, the sine bottleneck distance between two the multigraded Bell numbers of two persistence modules is defined as the usual bottleneck distance uh, between uh, the positive part of the bidding number or the even part of the bidding number of the first module added to the odd part of the bidding number of the second module and vice versa. And more generally, if you have a decomposition of the, of the Hilbert function or a decomposition of the ranking variant, you will replace those bidding numbers by collections of rectangles, uh, upper sets, maybe hooks or whatever, and then you will have the positive part of one, dec of one decomposition added to the uh, negative part of the other decomposition, and then symmetrically the positive part of the second decomposition added to the negative part of the first decomposition. So that's the general definition of the sign bottleneck distance. Now, um, why is it important to actually keep, you know, not do these simplifications as we saw here, here comes an example of, of what can happen if you do the simplification. So here's the example. Suppose I take a module that is just a direct sum of hook modules. And now the hooks are shown here. So the first one is this layer in gray in between these two L's. Okay, so between the first L and the second L. So that's my first hook. And then the second hook has a generator here and a relation here. So it's the, it's the gray layer between the second and the third L and so on. Okay, so the first hook has generator here, relation here, second hook generation, generator here, relation here, and so on and so forth until I reach the point one point. So this is a formal description of my model. So it's a direct sum of hooks. And now um, the interleaving distance uh, between this direct sum of hook modules and the zero module is actually one over n. 
it's easy because each one of these Google modules, uh, you know, is, is, is one over n integral equals zero. Now, if you take the uh, minimal rank decomposition by hooks, what's going to happen is that, you know, the uh, minimal, sorry, Hilbert decomposition, sorry, let me uh, refine this. If you take the minimal Hilbert decomposition of the Hilbert function of that module, then what happens is that, you know, this generator here and the relation standing at the exact same point are going to cancel out in the minimal decomposition. And so what you're left with in the end is that the, the minimal decomposition involves only this generator here at 0, 0, and the relation, the one relation at 1, 1. And now suddenly the bottleneck distance, the side bottleneck distance between you know, this minimal decomposition and the one of the zero module, which is empty set, empty set, this is one. Because you, all you can do is map the generator with the, the remaining generator with the remaining relation, and that costs you one to do so. Whereas if you keep all the multi-graded bin numbers, so if you don't do the cancellations when you compute the, right, the Hilbert decomposition, then what happens is that now you can, you know, you can associate the first generator with the first relation, the second generator with the second relation, and so on. And this actually costs you only one over n. Okay. So now we have defined a notion of sign bottleneck distance, which sounds to be natural for when it comes to considering decompositions. Uh, or multi graded linear numbers. And we also advocated the fact that maybe for getting stability in this sign bottleneck distance, it may be a good thing to not do the cancellations and maybe not consider minimal decompositions, but rather decompositions given by resolutions. So here I'm taking resolutions in the standard exact structure, but the corresponding counterexamples can be built in the right exact structure. All right, so here are the results that I can uh, display for today on this. Uh, particular case in uh, yeah on this. So the first one is that unfortunately the sign bottleneck distance is not a distance. It's not even a, like a pseudo distance. It's it's only a dissimilarity measure. And the reason is that it does not satisfy the triangle inequality. You can uh, tweak this example here a bit and actually show that uh, triangle inequality is infringed. And it can be infringed pretty badly. Okay, so that can be seen as a bad thing. But on the other hand, you know we can prove that it's universal among all the dissimilarities that are both stable with respect to the intervening distance and that are balanced in the sense that they are derived from unsigned distances between, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, between projectives, I would say, in our exact structure. So, for instance, between uh, free modules, if we take the standard exact structure, or between hook modules or hook decomposable modules, if we take, uh, if we take the right exact structure. Okay, so if you take a, the, um, if, your, if your dissimilarity measure is actually derived from the uh, in actual distance between, say, positive decompositions, then it falls into the category of balance, of so-called balance dissimilarities. And the bottleneck dissimilarity is actually the maximal one among those, in addition, um, if you add the, the constraint that they have to be stable. And so that's for the, uh, the distance itself. And now if we look at uh, the standard exact structure, so if we look at the composition of the Hilbert function, or equivalently if we look at the Benny numbers, or in fact if we look at the multigraded Benny numbers, then we get this stability result, which says that the sign bottleneck distance between the Benny numbers of M and the Benny numbers of M is actually bounded above by a certain quantity times the interleaving distance. And this quantity, of course, increases with the dimension that would be expected, and it increases quadratically with the dimension. Just so you know, I don't know what the, uh, if the bound is tight or not. I don't know what the actual growth rate should be, uh, but this is what, one bound, at least. Um, and now the second result is in this last paper in the list that I was mentioning, and this is about the bottleneck, the sign bottleneck stability of the multigraded bin numbers, but relative to the rank exact structure. So I added these L shapes here just to be saying that I'm talking about hooks here. So I'm talking about the rank exact structure. And so the bottleneck distance, the sign bottleneck distance between the relative multigraded bin numbers of M and those of N are actually, is actually bounded above by another quantity times the interleaving distance, and this quantity is grows at approximately at the same rate as the one that we had for the, the usual exact structure. Okay. 
So basically what that means is that if you're playing around, if your invariant is the Hilbert function, then you use, you should use the usual exact structure. And this is the corresponding, and the usual multiple event universe. So this is the uh, stability down that you get. And if you want to preserve the rank invariant, or if you want to play around with the rank invariant, then uh, you should use the rank exact structure. And therefore, your projectives are going to be the hook, mod the hook decomposable modules. And this is the corresponding uh, stability result that you have for the corresponding relative multi gradient numbers. Right, so this is basically uh, almost all I had to say about the stability part, uh, the stability of these decompositions. I want to go a bit further into generality. And I want to talk about additive invariance in general. So an additive invariant is, an, is a map from, say, the finitely presentable persistence modules to some abelian group A. And the axiom that this map has to satisfy is that it has to be additive on direct sum, or equivalently, it has to be additive on split exact sequences. Okay. So as we saw, the rank invariant is additive, the Hilbert function is additive, and those two fall into a category of additive invariance that we call the dim hum invariance. Okay, so this is a terminology that is being used in a paper by Blanchett, Brusler, and Hansen. And most of what I'm going to say now is actually derived from what they what they presented. So the dim hum invariant for this, you actually choose a collection of intervals, let's call it curly i. And the invariant associated with that collection is given by the dimensions of the home spaces from the element from the you know uh, interval module supported on the elements of i. Okay. So that gives you an, inver an invariant, which is a vector in z to the i. And uh, well, these dim home invariants include the Hilbert function as a special case, because if you take curly i to be the collection of positive quadrants or upsets of a single point, then uh, you recover indeed the Hilbert function. Uh, because the you know the dimension of the home space from a free uh, an indecomposable free module with one generator at say A to a persistence module M is actually the dimension of MMA. And now likewise, if you take I, uh, curly I to be the collection of hooks, uh, then you get what we call the dim kernel invariance. So the dim homes are actually equal to the kernel, the dimension of the kernels of the internal morphisms of the module. And this is, of course, equivalent to the ranking variant by the ranking additive theorem. All right. So now, whatever you know, choice of collection of intervals you may make, well, you have a corresponding dim home invariant, and you can build a corresponding exact structure, E sub i. Okay. And so this exact structure is formed by those collection, those exact those exact sequences on which your dim home invariant is additive. Okay, so these include the, uh, of course, the split exact sequences, but there may be many, many more. And now there's a general result which still follows from the, the paper by Oxlander and Zolberg that says that as soon as your collection I contains all the positive products, so all the offsets of a single point, so basically you're, you want to use a collection of projectives that is larger than the usual collection of projectives, so it actually contains it, then under this condition, which is very mild, then uh, your exact sequence, uh, your, your collection of exact sequences forms an exact structure on the module category that you're interested in. And uh, in fact, the indecomposable projectives relative to this exact structure are exactly the interval module supported on, your on the elements of your collection. And you also have for free that this, you know, this exact structure has enough projectives. So you can do homological algebra in this exact structure. And so now, if you take a finitely presentable module M that has a finite minimal resolution relative to this exact structure, let's call, it, let's call this resolution this way, then you get a canonical decomposition of its dim home invariant. Okay? So dim home of Ki of M decomposes as an alternative sum of dim, the dim homes of... Uh, oh, there's something wrong here. I think it's Ki to Mj here. I'm sorry for this. Yeah, it's Ki to Nj, and not Nj to M. Sorry for this. All right, and so you get a canonical sign barcode, which is given by the multigraded bin number relative to this uh, exact to this collection of intervals in even degree on the one hand for the positive part, and in odd degree uh, on the other hand for the negative part. Let me point out that these dim home invariants for arbitrary collection of intervals are different from the generalized rank invariants that we saw earlier. For the simple reason that if you take two intervals, the generalized rank invariant has always value 0 or 1, 
Whereas the team home in VRM can take larger values because the home spaces from a, a mo an internal module to another internal home module uh, could actually uh, be of dimension more than one. Okay, so here's a meta theorem that uh, Luis and myself came up with. And uh, it says the following. So if you choose a collection of intervals i, you build a crisp that contains the offsets so that your so that your relative projectives are going to include the usual projectives. And now you're assuming two things. The first one is that you can say you can actually work out a bone neck stability result for the projectives in your in, in your collection, okay, for the modules supporting the intervals in your collection. And if, on the other hand, you can bound the global dimension of your module category under this exact structure, then you immediately you can immediately derive a stability result in the signed bottleneck distance for the multigraded Bailey numbers, the decompositions given by the multigraded Bailey numbers uh, in relative to this uh, collection of intervals. Now, how do we go from these two action, two hypotheses to this conclusion? Well, the, the gluing thing, the, 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 the key argument is, is this result, which is a persistent version of a well-known result in homological algebra, which is called Chanuel's lemma for projective resolutions. So Chanuel's lemma for projective resolutions says, if you take two projective resolutions, m, m dot to m and n dot to n, such that m and n are isomorphic, then what you can do is that you can shuffle the terms around, take the first term of the first resolution added to the second term of the second resolution and so on and so forth and then you take the two new modules and those two are isomorphic now we have a persistent version of it which says that if m and n are, are not isomorphic but epsilon interleaved then you can do the same process except that you have to do shifts when you take terms higher terms in the resolutions and then you get an inter epsilon interleaving between the two newly formed modules all right, and this is how, when you combine this result with these two results, there is a way to combine them that actually gives you the, the stability down here. Now, how can you apply this? Well, you can apply this, uh, first of all, in the case of the upper right paradigm. So if you look in, if you work in the usual exact structure, um, then, uh, you know, you want to satisfy, you want these two hypotheses to be satisfied, but in this setting, you have them satisfied for free because basically the first result, the one on the usual bottleneck stability, between the projectives in your relative, in your exact structure, I mean, the, the, here the usual projectives, is already known. It's a result by Howard Jerkovic, uh, who proved it alongside the stability uh, of rectangle decomposable modules. Um, then um, the uh, the bound on the global dimension, if you assume your module to be uh, finitely presentable, then this is given by Hilbert CZG theorem. So the two hypotheses are basically given to us for free. And so you can immediately derive from this result an upper bound for the stability of the uh, multi the usual multigrade bin numbers. And that's how we get the, the result that I was showing earlier. Now, here's another case where you can apply it, the hook modules, the hook, no, sorry, where the, uh, your projectives are the hook modules. And uh, well, there, uh, nothing was proven before, so we had to prove it. So we had to first prove a stability result in the standard bottleneck distance for uh, hook decomposable modules. So for this, we took the proof of jerk of board and we basically adapted it to the case of hooks from rectangles to hooks. It was not immediate, like hooks and rectangles seem to be kind of dual to each other, but that was not as easy as this. We had to adapt it uh, in a more profound way. And now the, 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 you know, the, the, the actual meat of that, that paper is actually about on the global dimension of the uh, finitely presentable persistence modules on RN under this rank exact structure. Uh, and we actually have computed exactly the global dimension and we showed that it's 2n minus 2. And from there we did use this bound for the stability of the relative uh, multigrade bidding numbers. So again, I want to stress out that the stability result holds only for the multigrade bidding numbers relative to the exact structure we're considering. It does not hold for the minimal decomposition of the corresponding dim home invariant. You have to be careful with this, right? You can't allow yourself to cancel things out because otherwise you will be missing some elements to, to basically build nice matches. All right, and now we're about more general cases. So we don't have a definitive answer. This is, this is still a, an ongoing direction of research, uh, not, not only by us, but by other people. So let me mention, first of all, uh, Michael, uh, sorry, uh, Benjamin Blanchett and Eric Hansen and Thomas Brussler on the one hand. And on the other hand, there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's Wojciech Czakulski and uh, Martinez Palamiro and Parker is on the other hand. Uh, 
Uh, and so one possible approach is to, so, okay, so for varying, you know, getting a stability for the projectives, I don't really know how to proceed because so far we've just taken, been taking hover Djokovic's proof and trying to adapt it. And it's pretty clear that this is going to fail as we try to generalize the collection of intervals we're interested in. Like I've been discussing with Hover about this and he has a whole collection of counter examples that show that you can't really go far beyond the case of rectangles and hooks. So for this particular hypothesis, I don't really know how to proceed, but for this one, for bounding the global dimension, I think there's, there are some very interesting ideas out there. So one of them is in the paper by Don Shedrosen and Hanson. And the idea is to say, okay, instead of working with the exact, like the different exact structure in our original module category, what we're going to do is we're going to transition to an other model category where we will work with the usual, the standard exact structure. And this is what they do, and this is using the theory of projectivization, basically. So what they do is, instead of taking, you know, considering the modules over, uh, you know, uh, over the coset Rn, what they do is they consider the modules over the endomorphism algebra of a certain tilting element, which is given by the uh, by the direct sum, basically, of all the indecomposable projectives that you want to, to work with. And then the whole functor from that tilting element actually uh, gives you an embedding of the uh, subcategory generated by your targeted projectives into uh, the, project, the subcategory of projectives in that new uh, category. And in fact, it's more than an embedding, it's actually an equivalent an additive equivalence of categories. Uh, and so that, what, what that means is that you can go back and forth between relative resolution here and uh, usual projective resolutions, uh, relative projective resolutions here and usual projective resolutions there. And so this allows you to get an actual bound on the global dimension uh, relative to uh, you know, your exact structure you're interested in here in terms of the global dimension of the usual exact structure uh, in this other uh, module category. And this is what they use actually to prove, to give some balance on this guy in certain cases. Uh, I want to mention in passing, unfortunately, I don't have a slide written on this, but um, I, I didn't have time to complete the slide, uh, but I wanted to. Uh, so the work by uh, Chakos, uh, sorry, uh, Wojciech Chakowski and co-authors about, uh, for which they actually use, an, they also the same, use the same idea of, uh, they follow the same idea of transitioning from the original module category to another one, where they could use standard uh, projective resolutions, but they use a different way to uh, transition, and they use a different target category here. Uh, they transition to another concept module uh, category of our both sets. So that's the nice thing because you're working over both sets, so you can think, you can hope to use tools from topological databases, whereas this is not a both set category. So in the case of Tchaikovsky and co-authors, you get a both set. Uh, a module category of our set, so that's nice. And you go back and forth uh, through a, an adjunction, basically. Now, the problem is that the adjunction is not powerful enough in general to actually claim, make sure that uh, you know you can start from a regular res standard resolution here and get a relative resolution there, unfortunately. So they have to do something else, so then they introduce uh, the causal complex in the, into the picture, and thanks to it, uh, well, by massaging things around, I'm sorry, I'm going very quickly on this, they can actually uh, kind of, under some conditions, they can recover the relative uh, multigraded bit numbers here from the usual uh, multigraded, uh, from the homology of the Kazoo complex, sorry, on that other uh, module category. And with this, I'll stop. Um, maybe I don't have any conclusion to give because this is still ongoing work. This is a very exciting direction of research, I must admit, from my own perspective, uh, of course. Um, and I hope to see some, like, uh, great results coming out in the upcoming years on this. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to be sure that was the end of your talk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank sure. You very much, Steve. <laughs> and uh, thank you for, for a really fascinating talk, which is very thought provoking. Are there any questions? See, th this is a very general question, I know it, but uh, you know, uh, how advanced is the understanding of multi-parameter persistence in your opinion? Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's a question you can ask me now. You, you could have asked it to me uh, like 10 years ago and you can ask it to me uh, in 10 years from now. And I think I'm always gonna tell you the same the same answer, which is that we, we don't think we know, we think we still think we know too little about the actual, you know, the structure of the, module category 
uh, the category of persistence modules. Um, we, we believe that we know more than we used to 10 years ago, but uh, you know we're making progress, definitely, uh, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, it also depends on you know, what your objectives are. Um, you know, the, the objective of this work is kind of, it is not to try to encode entirely the structure of each model. Because we believe that this is too much asking. Because, you know, the modules can, the, the, the quiver, the underlying quivers or posets are, are, are wide type, so there is no natural parameterization of the indecomposable. So if you really try to encode your module exactly, this is going to be like just an impossible task. Or maybe you will be able to do it, but then you won't be able to interpret it, or you won't be able to compare it efficient, com compare these encodings efficiently, and so on. So there are two ways from there. So either you restrict yourself to certain subcategories. So there is a very exciting direction of research into uh, taking modules that are, for instance, interval decomposable. There's a whole uh, subpopulation in TDA who are really interested in this. I myself uh, am interested in this as well. And the other direction is to take is to well, give up on complete invariants and just consider incomplete new ones. And you know. Um, so far, we've been working with the Hilbert function and with the rank invariant, which are the very, what has very poor invariants, so to speak. But now, you know, now that we have this theory that's unfolding, you know, that is becoming more and more general, we can hope to consider more general invariants and ones that are actually more subtle, uh, more uh, um, <clears throat> stronger than uh, the rank invariant. And then we can we hope to be able to capture more of the structure of the module while still being able to encode the invariant and manage uh, work with them efficiently in practice. Indeed, it seems to me that you've just barely scratched the surface of the power of homological algebra in this context. So there may be a lot to exploit by trying to generalize more standard homological algebra tools to this context, although that might sort of become less and less computable. Yeah. Yes. So my point is, my positioning is to always try to find a balance between the power of the invariance that we come up with and the, the computability and the, the stability of these invariants. So that's why we're, I myself I'm making slow progress because I always need to make sure that there is this balance. But uh, yeah, I'm interested in seeing how far we can go. Are there any more questions? If not, then thank you very much, Steve, for a lovely talk, and uh, look forward to yeah. seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, sure. Thanks to you for inviting me, and thanks everyone for your attention. I hope I didn't have like I hope there are still some people out there. I don't see the list of participants, so I don't know. <laughs> maybe people dropped out, and maybe some others like just fell asleep. But uh, yeah, I hope like all the details are in the paper, so I invite everyone out here to like take a look at them. And, not only my papers, but all the ones that I've been citing here. Uh, this is a very exciting direction of research, and I'm, I'm a hope, like, I hope like I hope we can share it. The more of us can share it together, so that you know the more the merrier, obviously. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Have a nice uh, day, evening, whatever, everybody. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.